Just reporting the facts. <laughs> That's right. Um, Don't kill the messenger. I, I, I didn't make the snake. I just wrote it. <laughs> you must be this tall to ride Doc's rainbow snake. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This week on Backward Compatible, educational therapist Andy Howell joins us for a conversation about games and learning. Plus, impressions of the strategy game Star Wars Armada and the easygoing art game Hohokum. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Backward Compatible. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners. This is episode 41 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. I'm Doc, and I'm here with Chris. Hello. Jim. Hello. And my friend Andy Howell. Greetings and salutations. Now, Andy, do you want to be Andy or do you want to be Andrew? Uh, Call me Andy because only my mother says Andrew, and that's usually when I've done something wrong. Excellent. <laughs> Sounds good. Even um, at this age. Well, we've brought you on the podcast today for our meaty topic, which is going to be education in games, which is something that all of us have our own unique perspective and history on. But first, let's mosh. Get ready for the butt mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. I guess I'll go ahead and start off here. I've been playing NES Remix for the 3DS. Um, it's essentially a game where uh, you take on these short challenges from a whole bunch of different uh, Nintendo games, NES games, um, all made by Nintendo since it is a Nintendo published product. Um, but there's also remixed versions of this of these games to add additional challenge. So, for example. Um, you have you play through say the first stage in Donkey Kong as Link, but you can, huh. Link can't jump. Wait, so, what? Yes, so it makes it very hard because Link can't jump. So mm-hmm. you can't jump over barrels. So you have to be very careful. Mm-hmm. You have to you have to climb the ladder. You, you have to right time, time the ladders the ladder climb in at the right time. Huh. That kind of thing. So can I shoot a sword up at Donkey Kong and just finish? You can't the level? even use your sword in that level mm-hmm. on, on purpose. This, these are all like really quick challenges. Um, you do things like there's there's like mm-hmm. runners stages where essentially you're it's like uh, all those forward running games sort of that we have now where you're you're always constantly moving forward and mm-hmm. you just have to time your jumps right and it's just going through a diff- different short areas like segments in Metroid or segments in uh, Super Mario Bros lost levels things like that mm-hmm. so there's a whole bunch of different games to choose from and, and many of the challenges the challenges race were extremely simple to help you learn how to play the game mm-hmm. in case you've never played it before which I think is a really nice touch to very very difficult uh, expert level type stuff, mm. and even if a lot of them are, because I've played the uh, NES remix on the Wii U, mm-hmm. um, a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Um, but there's, I th- they also have a, a ranking system anywhere between one to three stars, yes. or three stars that are all shiny and flashy. Yeah, yeah there's actually four rank ranks really, because yeah. you've got that extra where you've got the three stars, mm-hmm. but there you get like an extra bonus for I don't know doing it extra quickly or not losing a life. I mm-hmm. forget. Exactly, I don't know. Kind of like S rank sort of. Yes, they just yes. don't call it that. So. so so it's really cool to go in. I mean, I know the first day I got it, I ended up uh, just in a day getting like around 200 or something right off the bat. Um, so it's like it's very, very addicting to just sit there and keep playing. Mm-hmm. And they uh, unlock stages and challenges by uh, based on how many stars you've collected. Yes. So exactly. um, doing the challenges then unlocks more challenges than the cycle continues. So it's a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. It's a cool game. Yep, it really is. Uh, it, it really does sort of bring out the best in uh, the <coughs> library. I mean, it, it's missing out on some of the, the non-Nintendo games that were on the system that were really cool, that could have been nice additions, but, you know, like your Castlevanias, Metroids, but, uh, not, not Metroid, I'm sorry, Castlevania, Mega Man, mm-hmm. um, but still, it does have most of the classics. Cool. Sweet. All right, um, Andy, what have you been playing this week? Oh, let's see, a bunch of stuff, but uh, lately, um, I recently downloaded the remodded or... Remodulate. I don't know how, what the mm. proper term is, but um, they uh, re-released uh, Kotor Two, and this was a like long time coming of uh, story insertions, and it wasn't so much a graphic or mm. any kind of um, a revamping of anything like that. Um, 
Back years ago when it was released, there were a lot of people who felt that it was rushed. Um, that you, you get to the end of the, the game. Ending. Yeah, you get to the end. Now, and before, can we get a look for, for those that might be listening going, I don't know what co- a KOTOR oh, is. Oh, well, yeah, that's right. You yeah. might want to explain that a little bit of course. first. Well, if they're not nerdy enough to know. No, all right. <laughs> um, no sorry. That's uh, Knights of the Old Republic 2. Yes. Um, Star Wars game. Too. Yes, yeah. yes. One of the best Star Wars games ever put out. Mm-hmm. The, the Old Republic series. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, anyway, so yeah, they, they released this game, and it was a fun game. I mean, it really had some story elements that uh, this was BioWare's, one of their first entries. Um, you know, this is kind of what got them to where they are today. And this was actually Obsidian. BioWare did not make this game. Oh, that, that's true. I'm, you're absolutely yeah. right. I, the, I get the two. I'm a yeah. huge fan. I'm a huge fan of KOTOR 2. I actually think it's better than the first one. Yeah. I think the ending did come across rushed, but I think the storytelling was better. I loved the, the gray Jedi concept. Oh, well, I thought yeah. it was brilliant. I mean, it was, the way it was presented. Oh, yeah. It was the first Star Wars game where they actually said, if you want to ride that fence and be in the middle, it's totally fine. And they let you do it. Cause but it was also very important to the narrative, too. It, was, it totally was. Important. Yeah. Yeah, uh, one of my complaints about the first uh, KOTOR was, you know, they, they gave you the light side, dark side, and but then they would say, okay, well, here are your choices. You can blow up the planet, or you can save everybody. Make your choice. And you're kind of going, uh, uh, so basically it's be Superman or be Darth Vader. <laughs> Okay. Uh, but in the second one, they actually give you more neutral choices. Like, mm-hmm. you know, instead of blow up the planet or save everybody, it was, well, save the important people. Mm-hmm. You know? And that's what I liked is that some of these choices were, in their own way, a little darker or a little uh, lighter. So, anyway, this new mod comes out, and uh, I haven't played it all the way through yet, but I'm already kind of noticing how. There's more. There are a lot more uh, dialogue options uh, when you're playing, um, and they're really playing up. Like you were saying, the whole you want to ride the middle, go for it. You want to be light, you want to be dark, uh, and they they totally let you choose your own path. And I just yeah, I'm remembering why I love this game so much. Now is this a um, an official uh, from the publisher re-release, or is this kind of like a a, a community? Um, unofficial release. I'm not 100% sure. When I first got it, uh, I thought for certain this was... I read an article where they said uh, whoever now owns the rights to it, that it had been almost 10 years, and they finally said, here you go, guys. Boop. And it came from the company itself. Okay. Um, now, the way you install it is through Steam and through Workshop, so to be honest, it could very well be fan-generated. But, okay. you know, I, yeah, I was led to believe that it was from the company. Gotcha. Because I, I, I know that um, it was maybe, it wasn't too long after it released, but there was a fan mod that sort of fixed the, because there was, at the very, very ending, there was some aspects of it that were very rushed. Uh, Obsidian oh, yeah. has a tendency to do this. Um, they they also uh, were responsible. Fallout 2 had the same sort of problem. Yeah. Um, also, Fallout New Vegas, when it first released, had mm-hmm. some issues. I still think it was significantly better than Fallout Three because it had a lot more. Again, those sort of gray choices. It was less. Totally it was less that, Nuka yeah. City or Save the City. I'm sorry. When I say Nuke, Nuka, it sounded like Nuka Cola. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, but Nuke a city, not like drown it in Nuka Cola. That'd, be, that'd right. be a nice choice too. But it, it did allow for those a lot more of a gradient, which I really, really liked. And I think that they've really excelled at that. When publishers like Bethesda or, quite frankly, Bioware tend to get way too, especially now. Nowadays, Bioware is way too caught up in this binary oh. sort of choice, which is oh, why totally. I really can't get into series like uh, Mass Effect or Dragon Age. I just feel that they're just yeah. too binary. The the, the dra- Dragon Age one remains my favorite yeah. of, of them all. I agree because yeah. there were truly some times where there were some dark decisions to be made. Where I, I don't care if you want to play the light side good guy. You had a decision that were both really stank. I mean, you're yeah. going nobody wins out of this. Mm-hmm. Um, and Choice, choice-wise, I totally agree. The gameplay yeah. refinements in future ones, I, I like playing to an Inquisition a lot better. I was going to say, yeah. I'm, I'm getting through Inquisition right now, but I, I agree mm-hmm. a lot of the choices do still seem to be, mm-hmm. okay, you'll save the world or kill it. And mm-hmm. I'm kind of going, well... Because eh. when I play these role-playing games, a lot of times I like to sit there and go, well, shucks, what would I do in this situation? Okay, mm-hmm. You know, and if this villain just... You know, slaughtered an entire city, and then turns around and goes, "Oh well, you know, shucks, it wasn't me. I was under control of this guy." Yeah, sorry, you, you still got some judgment coming, you know. <laughs> um, also, you're supposed to just take it on faith that what he's saying, what, he, what him saying that is also the truth. Totally, yeah. You know, or an NPC comes up and goes, "Oh, don't you worry. Before he laid waste to the city, we saw someone, you know, control him with a mind control orb." 
It's like, oh, okay, well, that's yeah. awfully convenient then, you know. <laughs> and also, like, who are you? Like, who are you? I don't right, know yeah. you. You're just some random guard that's in my employ? Because mm, we all know guards can't be bought off, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I agree. But I think that's more of just the video game mm-hmm. dynamic. You're just supposed to go, oh, yeah, okay, got it. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Well, uh, Chris, what have you been playing lately? So just last night, I played through episode four of Tales from the Borderlands, the Telltale game series. Huh. Um, and I've, I've said before on the podcast and on Twitter, I am really enjoying the series quite a bit. Um, what, what chapter is this? It is four of five. Four, oh, four of five. Yes. Okay. Um, Let me know when five comes out and I'll play it. Gotcha. Um, it's, it's been really cool. Uh, you know, you can definitely tell more and more with Telltale games. The more you play them, you can start to see, like, okay, here's where I actually have a choice and here's where I don't. And usually, <laughs> even right. when you have a choice, it doesn't mean too incredibly much. Um, but I've, I've come to think of them more as <clears throat> really cool sort of long-form narratives where you can feel like you are invested in the story because you are sort of taking on the role of these characters and you get to, at the very least, change how you react to what's sort of happening to you, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Um, The other thing that's really cool about this series, too, and I I don't want to spoil anything because you guys haven't played it yet, um, but if there was any thought that the series is just going to be kind of like a fun little spin-off with nothing that really affects the main Borderlands series. Um, to a certain extent at the end of episode three, but especially here in episode four, no, that, that notion is out the window because they do some things that actually really affect the world mm. moving forward. Um, like very significant characters get involved and things happen to or because of them that um, huh. will, will definitely affect the uh, the way the world looks next time you see it. So um, it's actually a really uh, a really neat game. If you're a Borderlands fan, go check it out. Um, it's not shoot and loot, but it's uh, it's a very very good game. So uh, Doc, well you're up. Cue the hippie music because I have been playing Hokum. <laughs> Very, well, you know, <laughs> well, okay, I'm not like, going to complain. That <laughs> 70s, yeah, okay. I'm sorry. I, I'm just, I was kind of into it. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. All right. Th- this is this is more of the uh, Lights of Incense kind of hippie music maybe. But, oh, gotcha. Um, okay. It, it, ho- hokum. Um, the word itself actually is a Native American tribe, but it's spelled a little differently in a video game. I thought it was like you're clearing your throat. <laughs> right, yeah. Zoom tight. I keep hearing Hulk Hogan. No, not Hulk Hogan. Okay. Ho ho come. <laughs> oh, I thought it was Klingon because you were going to. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to back away slowly from that. Now, um, the uh, the game itself is very hard to describe without seeing it, but. The metaphors that were used by the developers are safe. Um, flying a kite, for example. Or having a rainbow snake, for example. Um, my first experience... And you uh, said these are metaphors? Yeah. Okay. I Honestly, whenever I first started I would this go, thing... I'll, I'll say this, though. I would go to the doctor if I had a rainbow snake. Yeah. Well, and, yeah. and you know, it, it kind of felt like I was on this maybe microbial level or cellular yeah. level... Um, if you have a rainbow snake for over four hours, no way. <laughs> playing with other um, happy snakes who were swimming, let's call them tadpoles, towards a goal which was so it's like a birth, sort of round thing. and yeah, that's what it sounds like. Yeah, there there are other metaphors, but anyway, it's a family show. Um, really, what this is is an art game. Um, so so that's where you have to come at this from is. The designers were intending to have something that you could explore. I'm an explorer. I dig it. Um, you could have this very zen kind of experience, engaging with, oh, look, I'm now in this world, and little little people are jumping on my big rainbow snake, and I'm taking them around a <laughs> theme park. They're with the family show. And, yeah. <laughs> you know... Um, this is just going downhill really quick. What, what, well, it's, I'm just, I'm I'm just reporting really the facts, guys. <laughs> just reporting the facts. That's right. um, Don't kill the messenger. I, I didn't make the snake. I just wrote it. <laughs> you must be this tall to ride Doc's rainbow snake. <laughs> Okay. I would say that the actual name of the rainbow serpent is actually called Long Mover, but I don't think it's going to help any. <laughs> wow. No, that doesn't help at all. It um, makes it much worse. That's right. <laughs> How do you beat the game, Doc? Is that what you asked me? Okay. That's right. Let yes. me tell you. Um, How do you unlock achievements? In each of the 17 uh, worlds, let's call them worlds, which you can get through to by doing various things to unlock the portals and this and that. Um, there is another snake somewhere. 
and you have to figure out how to release that snake and once you've released rainbow snake um then we all get metal gear solid five or whatever it was i was gonna say so liquid snake solid snake rainbow snake right (laughs) Um, (laughs) but but it, Rainbow I, Snake I feel, is the one that you find on Tumblr, like hangs out on Tumblr. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. I feel I must stress that the the purpose of this game is not to beat it. Mm-hmm. This is the developer's stated intent: is that there are no um, there are no stated goals. There's no instruction. There's no tutorial level. There's no anything. If you just happen to feel uh, led through your explorations to have released all seventeen snakes, the credits will roll. So wait, if there's no goal, then this is not really a game. Right. It is an art game. How do By I know definition. I'm, how do I know I'm better at it than you are? Yeah, I don't know. If there's no I don't score. Know if I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and boldly <laughs> proclaim this is not a game. But it has victory condition. It just doesn't instruct not, not you to do that. Not according to the developer. The developer says there is no victory condition. Well there is a victory condition. It's just that there's it's an, not overt. There's an end state. Yeah, there's an end state, but it's not a victory condition according to the because well, if there's no goal, I mean this, this is uh the button mosh is not the place for We're me. moshing. Is, oh it is. Is this, this a game? This is the this no, is, this, is, the, the place is for this a game debate or what, what is a game debate is a much bigger question than we have time for in the button mosh. I thought it's just <laughs> if I just like hammer my gavel I got a gavel here. Yeah. If I just like put it down then that's it, right? No, that, yeah, that's it. I don't know. All I know is I just want to start painting flowers and everything now. There we go. Far out. So, ho ho Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. So I'm drinking my cup with the pinky out because that's fancy. Like a sir. <laughs> I say, good fellow, I'd rather enjoy this robust game, Star Wars Armada. Oh, it's a Star Wars game. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we should probably mention that. <laughs> Sorry, yes. From Fantasy Flight Games, Star Wars Armada. Oh, I gotta say, Fantasy Flight would be really hard-pressed to put out a game I did not enjoy. Most of the stuff that they've come out with, I have just kind of fallen in love with almost instantly. I, seriously, I, I, I'm hard-pressed to think of a game that I hated. There were a few that were yeah, okay. You know, you kind of pat them on the head and go, yeah, all right, that was fun. Seriously, man, they're hitting them out of the park. I mean, yeah. they're the new Avalon Hill. They they really are. Um, yeah, some some of the older stuff, maybe <laughs> Silver Lines, the Silver Line series, that kind of a thing. Um, you know, they've been retired, but uh, the new stuff's been fantastic. And and the truth is, Armada's no exception. I really wanted to hate this um, for two reasons. <laughs> the first being that I have a bunch of uh, Star Wars X Wing miniatures, and this was close enough that I felt like maybe it was. Um, not going to be worth getting into. The second reason that I really wanted to hate them is because even though it's a $100 board game, uh, within a couple of weeks they came out with a bunch of expansions and I just shook my fist in the air, curse you, curse you, because uh, I knew that I wouldn't be um, you know, throwing down the three dollars $400 it's going to take to get everything. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. uh, but that said, uh, we actually did break it out this week um, and wow, was super, super impressed with various aspects of the game. Um, my personal favorite thing about it is actually the way that Command is done. Um, that's something that I felt had been missing from the X-Wing. And it's something that um, I remember from the old miniatures game, what was called Star Wars Miniatures Battles. Mm-hmm. which um, had, Wizards did that one. Yeah, right? yeah, it was Wizards of the Coast, and it was about um, ten years ago, whenever they yeah. really were popular with the Star Wars minis. But... Um, they had a command token feature there where you could you could buy commands, and, and I really thought that that was uh, well done. That was well executed, and so mm-hmm. bringing that into this current version of a Star Wars miniature tactical game, I think, is great. The second thing that I really love is the the way that the movement works. I think that having that that movement uh, movement template is fantastic, and the fact that squadrons. Um, you've got three or four X wings or three or four Tie fighters on a little base. And they um, they represent that squadron, and they are move or fire, mm-hmm. which it, at first I wasn't sure I would like that, but it makes sense. They're staying in their little zone, they're dogfighting, they're doing all the cool stuff. Um, I think I think the phrase that I said to you earlier this week when we were playing, Andy, was that this is to X Wing what epic 40k was to 40k absolutely, <clears throat> and I I really like things on this macro scale because. You know, some of the games that are coming out, they give you this low level, you know, you're the commander. But honestly, when, you know, when you're commanding 60 or 70 different things, um, 
you really do you don't have the time to micromanage it and say okay now you little squad you move here now i want you little tank i want you to shoot over here you know it really brought back the old you know seeming strategy of you know we were talking about the avalon hill games where you're kind of the commander and you're sitting back and you give your commands and you go okay theoretically if i plan this right we're gonna win and when fate or something just completely destroys you you just go hmm yes well now uh moving on and you know like you were saying with the with the little the the fighters and the x-wings and whatnot on that kind of a scale i mean let's get real i don't care if you've got 20 x-wings Okay, versus one of those huge Imperial Star Destroyers. I mean, literally, they're they're supposed to laugh at you. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, you know, I if you want to use a real world example, um, you know, of course, you know, size scale not being you know relevant, um, but or being too relevant, I should say. Uh, you know, you take two fighters, okay, you know, from World War Two or whatever, against a humongous aircraft carrier or battleship, okay. And without any kind of torpedoes or anything like that, I mean, you're just, it's a joke. Mm-hmm. Okay? You're going to just sit there and, you know, waste all of your ammunition, and the ship's going to go, eh, that's funny. Okay? Um, and so it brings back that kind of aspect of, look, fighters need to stick to what they were designed for, and that was go after the other fighters. Smaller ships are escorts to the bigger ships. The bigger ships are supposed to just get out there, point click, shoot, and hopefully win. Mm -hmm. Okay? And it's the tactical aspect that kind of brought it back. Um, Don't get me wrong. I'm like you. I love X-Wing. I love getting, you know, six TIE fighters out there and just roaming around. Um, But again, it's that kind of micro feel. And I I really was starting not to like all of these different card combinations that you could come out with. It reminded me too much of other miniature games where I want to get out there and I want to see armies clash. I don't want to see two little squads that are completely and fully optimized for, you know, taking down an entire Death Star and then go at it. Yeah, a little too much like Hero Hammer. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Yeah. You know, there's just too much of that. And I'm going, I want a simple game where it only takes me ten minutes to come up with a list. Uh, And don't get me wrong, there are people who love analyzing metrics and spending hours coming up with these lists and whatnot. And for them, that's all the fun. Great. Mm -hmm. You know, bless you. Go play your game and have fun. Me, even at tournaments, I'm like, yeah, I didn't spend a lot of time on this list. I'm here to play 10 games in a row and have a good time. So, um, yeah, Armada, I think, really captures what it means to maneuver the ships. And, yeah, i got to admit, there are not a lot of naval games out there. And I know maybe that's just simply because it's not a popular theme. But even Games Workshop and some of these other guys used to have these naval combat games and... Uh, I know Babylon Five used to, and I know uh, Star Trek Federation Empire is still, you know, pretty big. Starfleet battles, um, but it really kind of captures, I think, uh, uh, this this market of. Uh, and since Fantasy Flight has the money, they can afford to kind of diverge and right. do this. Okay, um, you know, this is not something that some fly by night operation would be able to do and just pin their hopes on it. Um, I do, you know, obviously it is Star Wars. If this were any other game, I'd probably be kind of like, yeah, Like, you know, Star Trek. Love Star Trek. Don't get me wrong. Okay? But, you know, Star Trek battles, to me, uh, they were never about the epic music and the good versus evil, you know. Yeah, to, to use the example, I mean, in Star Wars, I mean, you're, you're munching on your popcorn. You're drinking your drink. You're like, oh, man, what's going to happen next? Well, at least not with the prequels. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you're just sitting there going, oh, dude. In the prequels, <gasps> you're like, oh, man, what's going to happen next? I know. You're just, you know, <laughs> Low-hanging yeah. fruit, guys. Low-hanging <laughs> fruit. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and so uh, in, in, in Star Trek, not to say there's not action in Star Trek, Star Trek is just a different type of sci-fi movie. It's right. supposed to be a harder sci-fi. Yeah. Less of the, like, fun action-y. It's supposed to be more, a uh, little bit more introspective, a little bit more sure. dealing with dr- more dramatic well, It's uh, more about theme. the characters. <laughs> yeah, more about, yeah, the characters yeah. And, and asking tough questions about humanity and, like, a different Totally, thing. yeah. And Star Wars was always more about... Uh, you know the epic journey. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, yeah. If you um, want characterization, that's what the deleted scenes are for. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You know, to hear George Lucas go, "Well, uh, I couldn't sell action figures with a love story, so uh, I took this scene out." <laughs> Thank you, Hasbro. No. Um, well, he put he put the love story back in in uh, episode two, and it was the greatest love story ever told. Right. Mm. Apologies to uh, Mr. Lucas, who is, as we know, one of our greatest fans here at backward-compatible.com, the podcast. 
Yes, of course. Good, yeah. good cover. Good cover. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> it, what's funny is actually I think we've been getting a little bit more exposure recently, and I'm curious if some people are going to hear that like so and so is a fan of us and actually think that's true. What, don't cut this part out. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing, <laughs> Chris? Yeah, yeah. For the record, for the record, uh, I, I fully support all the prequels. I love them dearly and would love to come out and visit the Lucas Ranch. Actually, it's one final thought. Um, one of the things that really impressed me this was kind of the final nail for me mm-hmm. was that um, whenever you're rolling for squadrons, you roll a lot of dice, but because the uh, critical hits don't count, basically what you've got is a lot of shots fired and only a few are, are impacting and doing damage. Yeah. And it feels the same way that it feels in the movie. All those laser fires just going all over the place. Mm-hmm. Every now and then, you know, a TIE fighter will explode. Yeah. And now, the official One Tweet RPG of the week. So this week's One Tweet RPG officially is as follows. Diceless. Game begins with a job interview. PC's answers become elements on their sheet. GM uses these to judge um, pass-fail for roles. Basically, the idea here, and this is somewhat inspired by the fact that I've been job hunting for a little while now, um, <laughs> but I wanted to try doing a diceless system, and I, I think I've technically done a few diceless little systems with one tweet um, up until now. But uh, this one I kind of enjoy because when you're at a job interview, you sort of give your answer to like, you know, what's your biggest strength, what's your biggest weakness, which is part of the process that we go to go through when we're actually designing characters for our um, tabletop games. Um, but then now you actually take your answers and based on the way you interviewed, the GM is going to judge in this situation, would this person pass or fail in the same way that someone's Mm. basically judging, how would you perform at a job that you're interviewing for? Mm. Um, so it's definitely a twist on the system. And I imagine a lot of people might be uh, a little bit irritated with the GM, um, because they're, uh, saying it's like, well, you know, based on the way you answered, I don't think you'd be able to handle this, but, uh, maybe it'll just help improve people's interviewing skills. So. (laughs) <laughs> I can already see the arguments now. Okay, so, you know, blah blah blah. This time, I would ne- my character wouldn't do that. Ooh, yeah, but in the interview, you said, okay, dude, it was a fifty k year job. The benefits were great. I was going to say anything. Okay, <laughs> you want want me to be a pansy? I'll be a pansy. But man, in the streets, let me tell you, <laughs> this is the gaming meta news and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. Uh, all right, well, we've got a gaming meta segment uh, here from uh, Doc because I, I, I know you mentioned that you wanted to talk about this new Kickstarter competitor, and I've been oh man, haven't really read about it myself. So I'm going to let you take point and explain the whole thing to us. All right, so close your eyes, breathe deeply. Um, no hippie music this time, but um, imagine what it would look like if Tim Schafer, Brian Fargo, and Fergus Urquhart, or as I like to call him. Uncle Fergus mm-hmm. had a baby. Ugh. Not a very attractive baby, I'm, I'm picturing here. Well, technically, <laughs> much love to you guys. Because, because of the Supreme Court, I guess the three of them could get married, but. Uh... Actually, no, they could not. Oh, that's right. Three. No, no, that's yeah, right. They'd yeah. have to pick one. They'd have to, like, you'd have to, pay, have to pair off. Can't Three people can't get married. <laughs> oh, you must choose. <laughs> this just went in a weird direction. <laughs> <laughs> you should have opened with that metaphor. I'm off, I'm off the game today. However, however, two of them could get married and then adopt the other. Oh, ah, oh, there we go. There we go. Okay, all right. Okay, we figured it out. I'm right. thinking. Tim, that, with, I think that Tim Schafer would be the child in this in okay. particular case. Right. Um, no, but the I, point I, is this. Well, that's that's supposed to be diamond. Doc. <laughs> Double fine in exile and obsidian big wigs. Um, the the three of them, mm-hmm. and, and they are working on a project together. This is really really exciting. Um, the thing of it is that they're not working on a game. Mm-hmm. What they're working on is, as you said, basically a Kickstarter competitor. Specifically for gaming, right? Specifically for gaming. And this is the thing. Hmm. Um, the website is called uh, Fig, and right now it's up. It's at fig.co, which is, what, like Cuba or something? I think it's just a lot of people use it for company. Com- oh, company? Oh, I, I assumed it was... But it's not com, <laughs> which is also company. Communist? I don't know. Um, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> Colombia. I, I, believe, I believe Chris is right, yeah. It's, it's just another, because co- so many have used the dot com. Yeah. It's just like another... Oh, company. see, I assumed it was out of Colombia, actually. That, that was no, I mean. no, no. Well, a lot of domain, domains actually do get published originally as like a, a place name, but then mm-hmm. just get used for other oh, stuff. Oh, fair enough. So what so. you're saying is that you figured that it was out of Columbia. Yes, very good mnemonic device. <laughs> um, yeah. Right now there's literally only one game up. It's called Outer Wilds. Uh, it's at, at the time of recording about uh, 74000 of its $125,000 goal. Um, looks kind of interesting. But what um, I'm more excited about, more interested in, is your opinion on whether or not you think that a crowdfunding 
four games is a good idea? And the follow-up question, since these three have pledged two pitch games on it, are we already doomed to failure? And by that, what I mean is the little guy, the mm. the indie developer, something um, you know Kruger and I know a little bit about, mm. uh, is the little guy going to even have a shot? So yeah, this is a these are a, big names. Another interesting detail I, I did look briefly at uh, kind of the article that was mentioning it's um, it's being started. Um, yeah, we'll other- cite our source. This is actually off of VentureBeat.com. Mm-hmm. Um, the the games beat. Uh, the article title is called Double Fine, and Exile, and Obsidian Big Wigs Create Kickstarter Competitor for Games with Equity for Backers. That's what I was about to mention was the Equity for Backers yes. thing. Um, it's intriguing, and I can see how a lot of backers would be interested now to back at a level that gets them some equity. Um, and people have asked, like, why doesn't Kickstarter do this? Um, you know, you're, you have all these people investing money in your product, and yet they see nothing from it aside maybe from some backer rewards. Um, and of course, that's a risk, just like any investment. You know, you don't know if you're going to get a return on that investment. Mm-hmm. Um, I would think, though, that you know, not to say that all indies would be scared off by this, but I know for me personally, if I'm crowd if I'm crowdsourcing something, I don't want to like my project for myself at least is small enough that I don't have to worry about managing two thousands people equity in my product. That's you know, true. Um, if I'm just trying Fair to raise enough. like you know five thousand dollars to make a quick game with some art or whatever, you know, that's I mean, and granted, you know, you don't have to offer equity. It's something that you can offer. Well, but I have a feeling that a lot of people are going to be scared off by that. Do you think that it's... Uh, aren't we just assuming that they're that they're making this for indies as well? Are you sure that they're not just... This is more meant for the the, mid, the mid-range companies that are sort of coming back I a little bit I honestly wouldn't be surprised. Like Obsidian, I, yeah. like In Exile. These are companies mm-hmm. that are not... The giant corporations mm-hmm. like like the EAs mm-hmm. or the uh, Konamis for now, um, because I think there that's a good point, Jim. Because I think there are yeah. some people now who are starting to be more and more wary of big, mid to large size studios that are coming in and wanting Kickstarter funding. Right. Um, you know, the the indie games are still all right, but then there are a bunch of people wondering, like, okay, well, why is this person on Kickstarter? They don't oh, need a Kickstarter. My yeah. my favorite was I saw a Steve Jackson game, mm-hmm. you know, come up on Kickstarter. I'm going, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, I was yeah. like, you know, you're 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 you know, Steve Jackson, you're kind of a big deal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, what are you going on Kickstarter for? And so they can get. M- millions, yeah. Mu- yeah. multiple, like tens yeah. of millions oh, yeah. of dollars. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, you totally knew That's why. why. They do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're like, oh, Steve Jackson, well, this is definitely going to make. Mm. You know, whereas I'll admit, there have been some things that I've kickstarted that I was going, oh, man. Mm-hmm. You know, I was really getting nervous. Mm-hmm. Um, you, know, you know, we're talking even after they've already taken the money and they give you updates and you're kind of going, um, all right, what's, uh, what's going on, folks? Yeah. You mm-hmm. know, and it, it truly is, you know, I, yeah, buyer beware, mm-hmm. you know, completely. Yeah. Sure. I, I, an example of that, I mean, Mighty Number. Number nine, which is a game that I was uh, really looking forward to, Mega Man sort of inspired game from mm-hmm. Inafune, and it's been it keeps getting pushed back. It's been pushed back into 2016, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. part of the reason why it was pushed back, uh, it was surmised they they withheld the announcement to push it back until afterward. But there was this other Kickstarter that the same company uh, again was running called Red Ash, which was supposed to be a spiritual successor to Mega Man Legends, mm-hmm. and. Um, yeah, essentially, essentially that did, actually did not get get funded, but they waited until after it it had failed in its funding to announce that Mighty Number no. Nine was going to be pushed back to 2016 because they were hoping that you know they thought if they had announced it beforehand, then it might get people to go, oh wait a minute, they can't get this game out. Why should we be funding them for another one? Yeah, which makes sense by the way. Mm-hmm. So there's already that stuff going on with with Kickstarter where there's there's that level of distrust for these for some of these people that might be even though they might be good. Um, you know, game designers of, of some of the games that we might really like at the same time, they don't necessarily make them good businessmen or, or, or Mrs. Men. Oh, or women. And- totally. Mm-hmm. There's been a couple of Kickstarters that have gotten in trouble and people are like, well, we gave you all this money and you made this one great product. And yeah. I always like to point out, it's like, folks, there are some people who they've got one great idea mm-hmm. and they make it work. And that that does not mean they're the perfect businessman. I mean, yeah. we were joking earlier about you know, uh, Donald Trump, but you know, a lot of people go, oh, "Well, he's been a, he's been a millionaire for years." So it's like, mm, yeah, he's also declared bankruptcy. Oh yeah, no, once. he's he's <laughs> failed many many times. Yeah, and you know, and, and most successful. To be fair, a lot of a lot of business. Oh, exactly, so. a, a lot of successful yeah. business people will tell you you fail a lot, but you succeed a lot. 
And I was really surprised the new 40K MMO that's been pushed back and pushed back. They came out earlier this year with a little program where they ba- – it was their own private Kickstarter where they said, hey, give us some money. We're going to give you beta access. Here are all the things we're going to give you and all mm-hmm. these in-game items. And they announced today that another one of their directors basically walked away from the project. And some people are starting to send angry emails going, well – Wait a minute! You said there was going to be a beta by Christmas. Now you're saying there there may not even be alpha footage by next year. And almost everybody was responding, guys. You you know it's an investment. You know, mm-hmm. and it's like yeah, you gave them a hundred bucks for all this cool stuff, but you know it is buyer beware. Mm-hmm. You know, and yeah, some of these lead names that are making stuff, you really want it to be good, but just like you said. That doesn't make them a great business person, you know. Especially if you have, if they have all these ideas, if they are these really creative types, a lot of them are. Um, they they might they're thinking really big, and they don't necessarily have someone that's going to rein them in and, right. and do mm-hmm. be the reality check. Someone's got to be the reality check person that says, "Hey, this is a great idea. This is not feasible with the money that you have here. So totally. we need mm-hmm. to we need to focus in on what we can do, as opposed to just branching out and doing everything that we want to do, and then everything that we do ends up." Sucking. I mean, essentially, because uh-huh. we can't instead of doing one thing really well or a few things really well, we try to do everything, and it all kind of turns out mm-hmm. as a mess. Well, then let me play devil's advocate here and say mm-hmm. these are three guys who've taken their beating in the industry. Arguably, that is true. They, they also are, taken their beating on Kickstarter. No kidding. Yeah. Um, but these are the kingpins. They've also of been indie. successful in Kickstarter. They've as well. been They're extremely easy. successful. But you know, these are these are the guys who. No matter how you look at the history, their names are in the textbooks. You know, they have been successful at creating their own companies. They've been successful at doing their own thing. They've been successful at bucking the system. They know how to play the games with the publishers who arguably take all the risk and deserve to take most of the money. Um, Well, what we're talking about here is a system by which we can uh, take publishing back into our own hands. Um... I was actually very encouraged, not just by the the article's um, overall optimism, but actually some of the quotes that are in it, because there's some really great interviews with uh, Bailey and also with Urquhart. And the very last thing that it says in it is, and this is Urquhart talking, he says, um, it's about us as well, but it's about the games we can help get funded. And I really liked that attitude. And what you said just kind of sparked something in me. If these guys truly can take alpha geek status status and help to rein in those and say, you know what, that's not realistic, and let there be some some channeling and let there be some guided practice here, um, I think that this could unlock crowdfunding in a new way and in a new era for something highly focused that is not going to be just the scattershot that crowdfunding has been up to this point. It's time to hashtag get wrecked with some talk about competitive multiplayer games. This past couple Saturdays, I've been playing uh, this this game that I sort of um, that came up with uh, with some friends uh, that I've just been kind of calling Retro Game Challenge. And the idea is that you know we hook up hook up an emulator, play some old NES games, they have a random number generator because each ROM is um, numbered. So it just basically picks a ROM completely at random. So naturally, you're going to get the cha- the odds of you getting the game that is actually good are pretty slim. You can mm-hmm. play a lot of like bad NES games, uh, and, or and Famicom games. And uh, the idea is to essentially to essentially pass the control around, play until you die, and see who can get the farthest. And it's, it can be pretty fun. I know we hmm. played, um, uh, what was it? I believe it was. I want to say it was Rambo. Uh, it might have been Rambo, which was a very interesting interesting game where it's like. Like an, a weird over the shoulder shooter that wishes that you had a gun, like a light gun attachment, but you don't, and you're like trying to move the use the D pad to aim your your crosshair to shoot things, but it like it zips over the sides of the screen. Yeah. And it's like it's very, very wonky to control. Yeah, that was actually one of the more fun games that we played. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. Or, or uh, we had this other one that was very cool where um essentially one of my friends got obsessed with trying to beat it's a game called Hoops. It's just really not a very good uh, basketball game for the NES. Mm. And uh, just couldn't beat the first guy. And the funniest part was that his the character that he chose looked like it was like a six foot five, really athletic guy. And the first enemy, it's like all one on one basketball game, look was a guy that apparently seemed to be about five foot tall, um, and overweight and very slow. And he demolished him. Like he he just he uh, the guy that he like stole the ball every time my, my friend was trying to take a shot, he got the ball ball stolen from him. Ugh. He got stuffed, he got dunked on. It was the most hilarious thing. 
So, I mean, these are the sort of things that, that could only happen in um, this experimental period, you know, NES, NES game experimental period from uh, the mid-80s, mid to late 80s. This Week in Gaming History. We do have two really big games, a couple of my absolute favorite games of all time. Um, first, starting off, The Legend of Zelda. The original Legend of Zelda, released in 1987 in North America um, on August 22nd. So oh, this is yeah. one of my favorite games, one of the earliest gaming memories that I have, one of the um, earliest games that I can remember beating. Um, mm-hmm. One of the games that you know I played, I played with. I also played this one with my grandfather. In fact, he was the one that introduced me to this game. So this is a very important and special game for me. Uh, Andy, oh, I can yeah. see that you have something to say about Legend oh, of Zelda. Oh, dude, yeah, no, this was one of the first games that uh, friends we, we would play Mario Brothers and all these other games, and we go, oh yeah, beat it, mm, yeah, okay. This was the first game where you get to a certain point where you're like, I don't know how to proceed. Yeah. So I'm on the phone, okay, and you know, for all of you younger listeners, uh, I had to go into hotline, right? yeah. I had to get on the phone in the kitchen. They had one that had the longest cord. <laughs> take it to where I was sitting and call my, my friend Ronnie and go, all right, all right, tell me you've gotten past the seventh labyrinth. Okay, the wall. Do I shoot it? What, what do I do? The bomb? I don't know. He's, okay, calm down. <laughs> this is what you do. But, yeah, you just brought up, yeah, the Nintendo hotline. Okay? Uh, I'll never forget, you know, mom and dad, you know, showing me the phone bill. Going, what is, what is, what is this? Yeah, and that's when it suddenly hit me. Oh, that's what they meant about rate per minute. Ooh, <laughs> my bad. You know, I thought they were rating my progress in the game per minute. <laughs> that's right. You know, and of course I'm like fourth, fifth grade, so it's not like I go, oh, my bad, mom and dad. Here, here, let me just whip out some cash from my wallet. Here you go. No hard feelings, right? Mm-hmm. Oh boy. <laughs> But yeah, oh no, Legend of Zelda is still the original. I mean, yes. still is something. I mean, even in my head, okay, I can still hear the music. I can hear the sounds of you know Link throwing the sword, and ugh. it's it's one of those games that I actually return to on a fairly regular basis. I've oh, seen yeah. it many, many, many times. So mm-hmm. it's one of those games I can return to and run through pretty easily. Mm-hmm. Um, not the second quest, by the way. That one can oh be second quest hard. Oh man! But uh, the first quest definitely I can get through that pretty well. Um, okay, and then the other big game release that also came out on August 22nd, apparently a big day in gaming, 1995, Chrono Trigger. Oh, mm-hmm. It's one of my favorite yeah. RPGs, Japanese RPGs of all time. Now, when I say um, August 22nd, I'm talking about, again, the North American release date. Mm-hmm. So this is one of my favorite um, RPGs. I actually did not play this until I went to college because I did not have a Super Nintendo growing up. Um, I could not afford it, actually. My parents, my family went through a hard time, so I had my NES for a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a Game Boy, that was it. So I didn't play uh, Super Nintendo games until I got emulators, but I was introduced to Chrono Trigger, and, you know, I, I loved it. I mean, I loved the art style. I had been a fan of Dragon Ball as well, and Toriyama does the art. Mm-hmm. And uh, the music is brilliant. Uh, the characters are really fun. Obviously, it's a very sort of anime-inspired game. But oh, totally. It, it has some great some great character moments. Mm-hmm. It really does. So it's really. Does anybody want to have anything they want to mention real quick about Chrono Trigger? Or I have not. I have not played very much. <clears throat> I actually tried playing a little oh, bit of a, um, a phone port. Oh, um, Chris, a phone <laughs> port. Yes. Um, oh. but I will say of Chrono Trigger that I do quite enjoy Frog's theme. I love Frog. I, I love. Uh, I love Frog. I love Frog's theme. Uh, Robo is another mm-hmm. another great theme, great character. Mm-hmm. The game itself is is I think definitely worth. If you've not played. Uh, Chrono Trigger, it's another one that I think it's, it's worth going back and playing. It, 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 it reminded me of, it was back in the day of when the Final Fantasy series, well, I, I scratched that, our Final Fantasy 3, but Japan's Final Fantasy 6. Yes. It was in that era of, you know, here were these Super Nintendo 8-bit, you know, area where it was so hard to get you engaged in a, a role-playing game, but with the, the the animations that they could do, and then it was the dialogue. You know, yeah. Chrono Trigger, Final Fantasy 3, these were some of the, the games where I found myself really getting into it like I was with a movie. Yeah. So when a character died or got hurt, I was kind of like, oh boy, you're going to get it, you know, more so than you're going, you know, Legend of Zelda, you're kind of like, yeah, Ganon's the bad guy. Got it. Stab, mm-hmm. stab, he's dead. Woohoo, I win. Mm-hmm. You know, whereas towards the end, you're going, oh, he got back with his wife. Oh, dude. Yeah. He really deserved that. Mm-hmm. And I'm just going, dude, it's a game. Yeah, but <laughs> the, the older macho part of me was going, shut up, dweeb, it's a game. Yeah. But, but, I mean, how many moments I mean, of those moments do you think were enhanced by the music? The music in that game. Totally. That soundtrack, um, is, at least for a long time, was the, the best-selling 
uh, soundtrack in Japan over you know for years and oh, years and years. It was yeah. imported a lot in America. I know I know in the U.S. I believe the best selling soundtrack probably remains the Vice the GTA Vice City soundtrack. Vice City, but with, Chrono Trigger is still up there. And, I was going to say Chrono Trigger. Yeah. I think Final Fantasy VII was was it's still probably big. still up there. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But I mean, it, it's because the music for this game was was so great, and it was oh, it yeah. was tied to so many really powerful moments. Totally. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, I think it's time to move ahead to our meaty topic. Meaty and we're going to talk about education in games. So, uh, want to start us off, Andy? Sure, sure. We all kind of have our own little oh, background in it, but yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, well, you know, I, I think it would actually be good if we just very quickly talked about our background. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah. Like an introduction? Quickly. Yeah, I mean, okay. we, we, we know who we are, and the That's really listeners awesome. know who we are. I don't but, know who I am. But I was, it would be really existential, right? We were, we were talking earlier about... That's why I've tried 20 different religions. I don't know who I am. But the truth is, you, Jim, and Chris, and I have all three taught game design on the university level. Mm-hmm. We have graded papers on the university level, which were game design documents mm-hmm. by students 19, 20 years old who were... Uh, writing the longest paper they'd ever written, which was a 30-page game design document. Ooh. Uh, but at the same time, you, you get to do this long enough, and you've got 30 kids in a class. I say kids, but uh, you, you do it for 10 semesters, and that's, that's 300 um, game design documents that you've read. Mm-hmm. And you get to... After a while, there's a smell test. They have this quality about them where within 15, 20 seconds, you can kind of feel the direction yeah. this one's going. It's like this one is going to be good or this one is like, oh, yeah, just another X. Yeah, right. and right. you may not know yet whether or not it's the, the A or the A-, minus, but you kind of know the ballpark in which it's in. So that said, uh, we have all had our various educational experiences, but Andy, what is your background in education? Well, uh, I have not had the prestigious honor to teach game design at a university. Uh, thank you all for rubbing it in my face. <laughs> no. Um, no, you're... I, I, I graded more than I taught. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and you're in the trenches, Andy. You're in the that, true that, trenches. That, that, that is true. That is true. I, I always like to say the, the white tower versus those of us in the trenches. Uh, quick background. Uh, started out uh, uh, in college, get grabbing that uh, teaching degree. Um, and uh, ironically, uh, substitute uh, taught for a little while, got into some uh, private school situations, and that's where a vast majority of my teaching comes from. Um, yeah, the all time greatest supervising teacher ever. Yeah, yeah, at, at this one school. I think his name was um, Dave. Yeah, he was a great guy. Something like that. Yeah. Taught me a lot. Um, <laughs> it, it, it was me. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, yeah, f- full disclosure here, yes, my first uh, school that I taught at was under the uh, prestigious, well, you guys call him Doc, I get to call him by his first name. Uh, he wasn't awesome yet. Yeah, you're grandfathered in, because yeah. I hadn't graduated yet. That's Back right. In, what was that, 06, 07? <sighs> Something like that. Uh, no, it would have been no. before that, 04. 04, that's that, right. 2004. Um, one of the things that, uh, uh, that I've had to pick up on is teaching at some of these private schools was innovation. You had to learn... How, all these different ways to either teach these kids or, mm-hmm. you know, um, smash curriculum into a 30 minute period. Um, and one of the things that I had a unique opportunity, um, I had a group of uh, these kids who wanted to do a kind of game club um, and they wanted to come during lunch. And some of them were, you know, reminded me a lot of myself. They were playing video games and some of them were interested in board games. And what I started doing was I said, okay, guys, how would you like to um, – It was it, we were doing history, and one of my biggest pet peeves is, you know, you, you know, some of these people say, well, I graduated high school, and I never learned about World War II because we never got to it, or I never learned you know, how to balance a checkbook. And one of my ways to fix this was I said, all right, fine. Well, we're going to design some games to play where you're going to learn these concepts. And so um, we were talking about the American Revolution, and uh, some of the kids were asking you know, basic student questions. Okay, how, why did this happen? How did this happen? Okay, why is it that you know this great superpower Britain couldn't take us down in one fell swoop? And to me, the answer was easy because I just want to look at them and go, "Oh, geez, have you ever played strategic Stratego? Mm-hmm. Have you ever played Risk?" Okay. You know, and so I said, well, okay, let's fix this. So I came up with this short little mini game where you had to control your colony. And, you know, I can, you know, full disclosure, I can say on uh, this podcast, I stole a lot of ideas from several board games. Mm-hmm. And um, they immediately picked up on it. They, they started to understand, oh, 
well, I see now. Um, I forget who what the actual situation was, but somebody said, why would you set up a battle to take place knowing you can't win, knowing that the odds are against you, and you're just sending people to die? I just don't get that. that that's just stupid to me. Um, and it was one of the battles in the Revolutionary War. And so playing this game, she finally came back and said, I get it. She says, I hate that I get it. But she said, sometimes you got to throw, mm. you know, something because it's going to help you down the line. You hate that you have to do it. And I, I just wanted to hug her and kiss her, mm. you know, and not in a bad way. I just want to go, oh, my God, you get it. Yay. <laughs> you know, it was one of those, you know, first times as a teacher, you go, wow, OK, I got through. Nice. Um, and that's what I did for several of these uh, students was we would have these little impromptu games where, um, you know, board games that we take for granted where it's resource management, military management, and all this stuff. Uh, some of them I even turned on to playing the Civil- uh, Civilization series. Okay? And they thought, oh, wow, this is great. I get to blah, blah. And again, you know, I had one student who, uh, he, you know, was this brutal anarchist and, you know, down with everything. Grr. And I would always tell him, I'd say, well, okay, but think about that for a second. You know, you just destroyed the government. What are you going to do next? And... He sat down and played one of these games, and he was kind of like, oh, <laughs> infrastructure, right. <laughs> okay. And so through that method, later we got to play like board game nights, and some of them were kind of like, oh, hey, you know, this must be where, you know, you got the idea or whatever. And, you know, I couldn't play the card of, no, I'm just naturally creative. <laughs> yes, I've come up with this whole system, you know. <laughs> um and so uh, I would say, you know, nowadays, since I teach more one-on-one as a private, uh, or a supplier, it's educational therapist, that's the official name. Um, since I work one-on-one, I don't get to play, I don't get to really do the board game aspect too much. But um, one of the things I still love to do is kids who just, they don't get math, they hate math. Um, some of them, I try to take some of these video games that they play, and I integrate the algebra into it. You know, favorite example is one kid was he was playing Dungeons and Dragons and he understood the whole currency exchange and I just went, hmm, okay. And I asked him, I said, All right, off the top of your head, how many silver pieces to the gold? And he goes, Well ten. And I said, Okay, great. If I have thirty three gold pieces, how many silver do I have? And he goes, Uh you know, and he thought of it in his head, and finally I went, Cool, algebraically, and I set it up exactly as it would be as a word problem. Mm-hmm. You know, turned it around, showed it to him, and he kind of went. <laughs> he still had that you know deer in the headlights look of, <laughs> you know. But then he got it. And he said, "Oh, so it's okay if I do half in my head and half on paper." And I went, "Well, teachers like you to do all on paper." But you're getting it. <laughs> um, and that to me seemed such a natural progression, a natural thing to do, because uh, so many students. Uh, they they totally would get math so much quicker if it seemed like it was practical. But even growing up, okay, uh, you know, math, I forget, I think it was Lucy and Peanut. She said, you know, what kind of sick society do, do you tell a kid to go to the market and only get six apples, four oranges, but only if the strawberries taste good? <laughs> <laughs> you know? When the train is heading. Oh, right, you know, down. like, who cares when the train is, you know? Yeah. Um you know, I think it was one of my favorite memes was uh, how most people see math problems. And it says, you know, if Jack has one dollar and cows go moo, if the roof top of a house is purple, how many pizzas can aliens invade us with? <laughs> you know, and the so, answer five. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and the answer is five. Um, well, was that deep dish or thin crust? Well, yeah, toss? Exactly, I mean, yeah. Um, if it's very it's dish right? in Chicago, it's New York. It's but you're still going to lose points because you didn't say five pizzas. Oh, there we go. I you just took that to off. the units. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You didn't put no, it in units. <laughs> oh man, when I tutor kids in chemistry, that truly is a nightmare because you know half for me half the problem is remembering what stupid units we're using. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, I'm sorry, I digress. But all all this is to say is. Um, my most successful endeavor was uh, using these board game things to get them to realize there's more than one way to tackle a problem. Because um, every time I get asked, they go, how come I got to learn Algebra 2? And I said, true. A police officer's never going to stop you and say, all right, you got a speeding ticket, but I'm going to let you out of it if <laughs> you can tell me the degree using sign in this triangle. <laughs> you know, I said, no, that's never going to happen. But I said, what it, what the general education is supposed to do is to teach you how to get yourself out of a paper bag that's on your head, okay, to logically follow steps, to think, okay. Mm-hmm. And um, 
So that's what I tried to do with these little games was to get them to realize all of this history and these economics that I'm trying to throw at them actually did have a purpose. It had a, there was something behind it. Um, you know, interest rates. They're just like, I don't understand why that's important. And then I would demonstrate to them using an economic type game. Mm-hmm. Uh, they would understand, oh, well, it's all about maintaining cash flow and it's all about blah, 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 blah. Uh, you know, they would understand, you know, this one kid famously just went, how come video games cost so much? I almost backhanded him because I'm like, you know, I was like, dude, it's been fifty, it's been fifty to sixty for a long time. Uh-huh. Yeah, I don't want to hear you complain. In my day, no. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, you know, but I told him, I said, well, you know, GameStop has to price it at a certain thing, and blah blah blah. And yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. And um, you know, although admittedly there were a few games that the uh, at one school the administration didn't really appreciate because mm. it involved Nerf guns. Uh. Um, <laughs> you know, now to be fair. It started out as, okay, they were using rubber bands and Nerf guns because they were we were trying to demonstrate artillery and how it, you know, all that kind of stuff. So they were firing these things across the room to watch these plastic men. Well, okay. <clears throat> Full disclosure, they were 40K minis that I didn't care if they got damaged. Um, <laughs> You know, but they were. Try- I was trying to demonstrate that, and of course, I'm dealing with teenagers. So you give a teenager a Nerf gun, and they go, "Oh, yeah, that's right." You load it, you pump it, and you fire it at somebody and aim for their eyeball. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there were a couple of times where students were kind of like, "Hey, Ted, what?" <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but anyway, yeah, that's uh, the the Nerf zombie war of uh, 2008 is another story. Um, but essentially, yeah, that's that's one of the things that I try to do is uh, as a you know, high school and middle school teacher was uh, just get these guys to try to realize that there were you know there were concepts that I wanted them to pick up that they could forget after the test on Friday. So um, if, if I yeah, if I had to look back and you know what what would I do different type things, I, there's not a lot I would change uh, because the uh, the kids liked getting interactive and they liked the fact that. Um, they uh, they didn't have to stare into a book for hours on end, uh, and I think you know because of that, you know it was one of those teachable moments. You know, to borrow one of your terms, I hear you a quarter now. Mm. Um, it was one of those teachable moments where, for for just that brief time period, they got to just step aside, forget about the books, forget about you know lessons and all that kind of stuff, and really just get interested in something. You know, to this day, some of them. Uh, may have gone on and are toppling great empires, or they could be homeless. I don't know. Um, but, you know, at least for that one brief second, they actually got to understand, uh, you know, this is a concept, I wanted you to get it, and I got it, you know, playing this game. Mm-hmm. Or I gave it to you playing this game. Rather than be the stodgy, you know, teacher um, that just says, alright, memorize these dates. Mm-hmm. So, Andy, <laughs> yes, what would you say your philosophy of education is? Oh, wow. Um, philosophy of education. Hmm. No one's really asked me that in a long time. Um. Well, then I'm sorry. You don't get the job. <laughs> dang it. <laughs> um. Be snappy with those answers. That's right. Gotta be snappy. <laughs> uh, uh, to get him to pass the test. Next. No. Uh, <laughs> Correct. What, you're hired. I was going to say, what, <laughs> what national test are we studying for? Well, I'm getting them ready. Um, philosophy of education. Teach to the student. Don't tell the student, here is the bar. Now all 1,000 of you come over to this bar because none of us learn the same way. Okay, Now we can all agree on various methods of learning. Okay, But there comes a point where you know, if someone were to come in here right now and say, you're having a test in one hour, uh, here are your notes. We would all panic, but you know, we, uh, we would all learn it our own special way because we know ourselves. We know what works. Okay. However, you know, one of my favorite cartoons right now uh, that's going around the internet is there's a picture of this person at a desk saying, okay, everyone, here's a test. We're going to give you this test. Whoever climbs that tree the fastest is the one who gets the A. Okay. And you see out in front of them, there's all these animals. There's an elephant. Okay. There's a, like an anteater. Okay. There's, you know, all these different animals. The monkey is going, woohoo! He's all happy and excited. But all these other animals that you go, well, they can't climb a tree. You know, that's the whole point is that I really feel like the educational system right now is saying, we're going to test to see how fast you climb that tree. And the elephant and, you know, the shark and all these other, you know, students are kind of going, well, 
okay, but is there is there another test I can take? And there used to be a stigma. People would go, mm, well, you're, mm, if you need another test, mm, you're one of those special ed kids. And what we're finding is that people just learn differently, mm-hmm. okay? Um, one of my, uh, in the school that I taught with Adam, there was one kid who he could not sit down to take a test to save his life, okay? He just couldn't do it. But if you gave it to him orally and you let him wander the room, A+. Plus. <laughs> I know who you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the kid got an A+. Plus. And what was really fascinating was I had a, a mentor uh, from the certification program. She was amazed. She was like, you let him do that? And I said, yeah, watch. I had him sit down, gave him a test, and <clears throat> he freaked. Yeah. Yet, I walk around and say, hey. You know, I'll omit the name just, you know, because he was a kid at the time. Mm-hmm. But I'll say, hey, explain to me uh, the process of meiosis and cell division. Mm-hmm. And off the top, he goes, well, okay, well, basically it's blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. And meanwhile, he's playing with things on my desk mm-hmm. and he's kind of walking around verbatim. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're talking, it didn't get prettier than that. <clears throat> and that was one of my major things was we need to start teaching to the students. Mm-hmm. Um, this outdated model that we have, I think, is really failing our kids. Okay, and that's why, you know, Common Core and all these different things, <clears throat> I think those are just Band-Aids they're trying to put on the wound. Mm-hmm. So, and so how how can we connect that then to gamification, technology, <clears throat> and a lot of the modern things? I, I'm reminded of um, something that was uh, on my Facebook feed just this week, and it was the Cancer Research UK, and this game called Play to Cure Genes in Space. And it's basically um, a bunch of data about uh, cancer genes that's been crowdsourced. And as you run the levels, basically what you're doing is you are helping the scientists to run simulations on the genes themselves as to whether or not um, a particular method might or might not work in fixing those genes or identifying those genes or that sort of it, Basically, it's, it's like the, the SETI at Home program, but for, for cancer research. Huh. Um, hmm. So, I mean... These kinds of examples are, are kind of what interest me. Um, I love the idea of individualization. Where, how can we do that? I mean, it's the twentieth, twenty first century. I I don't have my hoverboard yet, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it is. I hey, you know what? According to Back to the Future Two, we still got to December, but I haven't seen my. my I it was October. Oh yeah, maybe it's October. Yeah, okay. I, sorry. I think Lexus put out a hoverboard, but it's like I, I think there's something about like it only works at a specific park that's yeah. set up a certain way. <sighs> also, Blur. it's like according to the internet, every single day is the is the same day. Oh it's, yeah. They always they always edit the the picture of yeah the, that the, one the little glory, picture yeah, yeah to make it seem like it's that day. Hey, today's the day that we're supposed to get the right. hoverboard. Uh, but to what you were saying, I, there's a lot of public schools right now that are offering online uh, homeschooling. And years ago, homeschooling used to be very taboo, at least here in Texas. <clears throat> um, but um, a lot of public schools are now offering online classes where you have one teacher and you have maybe four or five students that they connect with. Um, to me, I think that's the first step in the direction is that um, if you, instead of trying to hit 40 kids at once and say, all right, here's the info, you've got those five and... Um, you know, you talk about integrating the technology and things like that. Um, I've even seen programs now where um, the students can write something on a tablet. It shows up on your screen. And so it's like having a personal blackboard right in front of you. Because when I was in the classroom, I would have sometimes have tutorials and the students would come up. I would write something on the blackboard. Well, I'm sorry, the marker board. <clears throat> Dating myself there. Um and they would come up, and side by side, we could do things. And I thought, okay, well, that's pretty cool. And so with these interactive uh, technologies, we can start moving that way with math. I keep going back to math because nine times out of ten, when I get a phone call, it's my kid needs help with math. Um, and so, you know, one of the things, uh, the Simpsons parodied this, but they're starting to look into it. Um, <clears throat> there was some kind of program that Lisa Simpson wanted where she put on these, you know, virtual reality goggles and Genghis Khan shows up and he goes, hi, Lisa, today you're going to follow me. Pillage what I pillage. Kill what I kill. Let's <laughs> learn history. You know, and it always cracked me up, but they're almost getting to the point where they can have interactive things that say, aha, well, here is modern day, oh, I don't know, Vienna. Okay, they say, here's modern day, but, you know, snap their fingers, here's what it looked like, or as best as we can tell, here's what it looked like 400 years ago. 
And what I saw is that they overlaid the modern day picture with an older model. And for I'm a big history guy, that was phenomenal because then they could look and see and go, whoa, you're telling me that some of those same streets that you know, some of these famous people walk down are still there. And it, it helps to bring the history alive and make it relevant. Um, and so when we talk about integrating the technologies in this way, that's what I would like to see is, um, you know, because with video games and, you know, uh, you know, movies and stuff like that, we're getting to the point where things can be very realistic. Okay. Now, of course, we say that you go watch a sci-fi movie that was only five years old and go, oh, it's fake. But... You know, if we can somehow harness that and put it into, just like you were saying, you know, the doctors are like, mm, let's see if this works. Um, I mean, I, I joke, but the game Operation, mm. okay, you're, you're trying to be very careful. You're like, oh, God, oh God. Ah, I buzzed. Okay. What, but what if you could come up with, I mean, they've actually come up with simulators where they say, okay, you know, here's a digitized leg. Make your incision. All right. Hey, you know, where, you know, you cut too deep or, hey, you did this. These things are already in medical schools. And while I agree, you know, everyone should have the same horrifying experience of having to cut open a pig or a frog in their high school, uh, <laughs> you know, class. Um, you know, that is something I could easily see happening with, uh, with uh, you know, a lot of schools are doing the iPads and tablets. Um, you know, yeah, you know, some kid getting a stylus and going, okay, you know, I better cut very gingerly. Even if that child, or I keep saying kid, child, even if that student has no aspirations of being a doctor, okay, there is still something to be learned from that one moment of saying, wow, I better not cut too deep. Or, ooh, you know what, if I cut that, you know, if I cut that muscle or whatever, that's going to be really bad. Mm-hmm. We're getting to the point to where a lot of schools are doing the iPads and the tablets and I think, you know, instead of the whole Star Trek example of every kid goes, here's my test, send, you know, and they go back to texting their friend or whatever. I think we're getting to a point to where uh, even, you know, film day, you know, we're all sitting in a class. There's the one screen, but that's the one day you decided to sit in the back of the class. Um, and you're kind of like, Man, dude, I can't see this. I can't hear it. Some doofus has got a huge head. It's in the way. Now you're sitting there looking at it in your hands, and um, <clears throat> even some interactive things are like, you know, hey, you want to know more? Click here. So the kid's still watching the program, but they can click this little button and go, oh, son of a gun. Okay, so John Adams, you know, really did blah, 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 blah. Huh, okay. Um, HBO did the John Adams series, and if you buy the DVD set, you can actually put on the version where you click the remote, and it'll do like a little pop-up thing. And gives you a little bit more about that scene historically. And I thought, dude, you could totally do that in a classroom. Mm-hmm. You know, I've actually shown one of those episodes because they talk about the Constitutional Convention. Um, and I, those little blurbs come up and the kids are like, oh, wow, really? I didn't know that. And if they can just that once, just that once go, oh, wait, okay, yeah. That makes that makes Ben Franklin human. Hmm, okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, know, it, it, it's, you know, if we can get that, then hmm, I think we're golden. Yeah, you know, and you can also go into the the fields of literature and things like that because uh, you know teaching poetry is always a challenge. Um, you know, if we can just get you know a, a fact where there's a poem up on the screen and uh, there's a couple of there's like a a praise and a critic you know, critic bleh, can't speak uh, someone criticizing. Okay, then they can read it and they go mm, yeah oh, I could, oh, yeah yeah this poem sucks. I like this guy. He explains why. <laughs> Because um, that's what I would do is I would get up there and say, "All right, here's a poem." Okay, have them read it, and of course, nine times out of ten, they go, um, "It's a, it's a, it's a, about a spider, I, I think." And yeah, I just kind of go, ah, "I get it." Put the positive one up there, and they go, "Oh wow, really? It's it's about living and dying during the depression." <laughs> I didn't get that. I put the criticize. They read it and they go. I'm totally with this guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Blah, blah, blah. But right there, I told them, you know, I, I was able to go, guys, poetry is just like music. Okay, there are some songs that speaks to your soul, and you're like, mm, you get emotionally charged when you hear certain songs. Okay, or like we were saying, a score from a video game or some, a movie. You know, you just you get pumped. And there are other times you're just kind of flipping your thumbs, going, 
Ooh, maybe they won't notice if I uh, hit the skip button. <sighs> you know. Any musical ever. No, not ever. But. You know, right, exactly. <laughs> you know, again, so that, you know, when, when, with poetry or with any kind of historical document, um, they have this thing in Rome I saw where um, they have this book where it's like, the you know, some like Leonardo da Vinci's book. And they said on the left-hand page is Latin or whatever, you know, Italian, whatever language he wrote in for this particular book. And on the right-hand side, you can pick the language. So you leaf through the book, but there's your translation on the side. But there's the original. And I thought, wow, we could do that. You know, we could flip that. Because when I was teaching Shakespeare, okay, the kids were freaking out. They're going, I don't understand. And so I found this great series called No Fear Shakespeare, Mm -hmm. where they've got, you know, Oh, Titus, dost thou riddle me? You know, all this kind of stuff. And on the right-hand side, it's like, Okay, why are you doing this, dude? I mean, I actually use the word dude and hey, man. And I thought, oh, I was I was actually upset because I'm going, I totally had this idea in college. <laughs> I could have got I could have dropped out of college. I could have told my wife that we're going to move to Hawaii and live there the rest of our lives. <laughs> but no. <laughs> to be fair, it would have required you to read and translate all of Shakespeare. Well, it's it's in English. I I know English. <laughs> actually, <laughs> Actually, probably not, because probably as, as long as you have the idea, and you can like you know patent that idea, oh, get somebody else to do all that work point. for you. Oh, that's true. Probably. That's true. Yeah, um, you're a businessman. You don't get your uh, you go. you dirty your hands. You hire me. Yeah. That's, that's there we go. I was like, yeah, li- li- yeah, you literature art nerd. Here, translate this. <laughs> and you're in Hawaii. You pay him in like fruit, like pineapple. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Shut up, or you don't get an extra pineapple. <laughs> they have fruit. What they like is spam. There you go. Spam. Yeah. Oh. yeah, spam. Spam's big in Hawaii. Really? Yeah, it always has been. Spam, ah, spam, spam. I was going to say, ah, I don't like spam! <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, actually, uh, a thing that I did um, when I was at UTD is I was a uh, research assistant in the uh, games and learning lab. And among other things, one of the things we were looking into was uh, games and pedagogy. Um, basically, how to apply gaming in a classroom setting. Mm-hmm. And there's like a kind of, a, it seems like there's a couple of camps and it's mo- based mostly on misconceptions about what games are and aren't. Um, and there are some people who think that if you're designing a game for learning, basically it's just like you have a software suite that you give to the kids and you just tell them to play through the game and they're going to know everything and pass all the tests and that's going to be that. Um, when in fact it's more like, and this is kind of getting to your point, um, that it's it's a tool that you integrate into the program to like, in the same way that we have film and we have, you know, different things that students can do. So like the visual learners have their thing and the auditory learners have their thing and the readers have their thing. Now we also have games that can get people engaged, get people interested. Um, people who learn better by doing, um, have a chance to do that. And, um, it's just one more tool we can integrate into the classroom and have, um, like you said, kind of like the cool like pop-ups and stuff like that that help give you extra information, let you sort of, um, I think what the games can do in learning, um, and this is kind of one of the bigger takeaways, um, was that it motivates the student to want to learn on their own, to find their own way of learning. Oh, totally. Um, and that's kind of like, you know, it's it said a lot in, uh, you know, throughout high school and throughout college, uh, especially in college, um, that what we're doing is teaching you to learn how to learn. Absolutely. It, so, so for the rest of your life, if there's something you need to learn, you can go and learn it. Yeah, that's, that's I tell everybody that's what you learn in college is how to, to teach yourself. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, jokingly, how to learn yourself. Mm-hmm. There was an interview that uh, Sid Myers did, uh, Sid Meyer, um, did regarding um, a whole bunch of games that he made, but the one in particular that came to mind was Pirates. Pirates, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And it was funny because he heard a story once of a kid who was terrible at geography. And yet, um, when he got into school and they were studying, you know, the the Caribbean, he knew the name of every port in the Caribbean because in Sid Meier Pirates, <laughs> right. yeah, you need to yeah. you know remember like where this place is and like you know totally. what, what like what the trade values oh, yeah. were for different stuff. So you had a reason in your own mind to slowly learn it as you play. And then like when you need to go apply it somewhere, it's like oh yeah, where is um, you know Port Royal or whatever? It's like oh, it's right yeah. there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I know I know New York yeah. City really really well because of Spider Man too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, well, uh, I was uh, one of the early board games that I remember playing. I didn't get that they were getting these names, uh, like Axis and Allies, the mm-hmm. original one. A lot of these names for these areas, I just took for granted. I went, mm-hmm. oh, it's a French sounding name. Mm-hmm. Good for them. Mm-hmm. Well, I start studying World War II history and I go, 
oh my god, these were actual places? Yeah. You know? And the teacher was like, okay, well, does, can anyone tell me where the Ural Mountains are? And I went, hoo, 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 hoo. <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, 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 because if you don't take that space, then Germany can't, t- uh, never mind. <laughs> you know? Uh, but yeah, and that was that was so cool. Mm-hmm. And that's that was one of my clicking moments. I went, ah, you know, so I went back and studied all these different maps going, oh my god, I understand mm-hmm. now. You know, I'd love to close on this note then. All right. Um, you know, in her first TED Talk, Jane McGonigal, mm-hmm. who's one of my favorite people to uh, read up on because she's so exuberant and yet she has such an interesting backstory, traumatic brain injury, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, we'll and headmistress of Hogwarts uh, for a while. I think that's a different McGonagall. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's her mom. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. But Jane McGonagall is um, one of the, I really think, um, fantastic women game designers out there right now shaking people up and she also has a background in alternate reality games is something we share Um, but she said that there's an alternate form of education out there right now which is called video games and she used WoW as the example it's where she got her data from whenever she World of Warcraft for those who don't aren't familiar yeah I think everybody knows that one (laughs) I would hope but you know there's going to be one person going WoW WoW what What? yeah you're right you're totally right it's it's not Um, as big as it used to be so maybe so that's a good point yeah yeah, okay that's true Yeah, Uh, but anyway still massive she she basically said um, if you subscribe (laughs) to the 10,000 hour of mastery that there's a, a parallel education system that's happening in America and really in the Western world. And that is that by the time you graduate, if you have perfect attendance, you've attended about 10,000 hours of school. Coincidentally, that's also probably about the same number of hours you've played video games. So Hmm. we actually have this entire second set of education, skills, that sort of a thing that that we're learning. But what is it? And that's the question she puts out. Hmm. What, What is this... Thing. And so she spent the last five years sort of researching that and trying to tap into it. And I think she's done a very good job of gamifying things that um, need to be gamified, like um, educating third world countries um, about clean water and how to grow crops and how to irrigate and things like that. Um, anyway, I, I think that if we look at it from that perspective, of we've got such cool technology, we've got such cool tools. Um, you know, game and game design has advanced into a place that is just really, really neat right now. And yet, we're not empowering the people in the trenches, like you, Andy, yeah. um, to to do this and to use these tools and to experiment and to play and to have fun and to encourage kids and, and make, um, make learning fun and interesting and, and explorative again. Um, we're just not doing it right if we're not doing that we're not doing it right um so i don't know i I think that this is a topic that isn't going to go away i Mm -hmm. think it's going to get bigger Mm -hmm. and it's going to be really really important it may be the big topic of uh, the 21st century Mm -hmm. i really don't know if you know if games are here to stay and i believe that they are and they're going to become a part of our enculturation from every aspect to the point where my one-year-old already knows what an iPad is and he already wants to play his games. Mm-hmm. Um, what's that going to mean whenever he gets into school and he has five years of gaming history behind him? Mm. Well, to the point. I mean, I think everyone uh, here grew up in a school that had some kind of computer. And I'm in an eighth grade computer literacy class and the lady teaching it is going over commands. And that was one of the first times I was like, I know basic. I, you know, that was that first student moment. Oh, I know more than my teacher. <laughs> okay, I think we're going to see more of that, where possibly technology starts to outstrip what you know they're learning. Now, having said all of that, I think there's also the ramifications of, you know, they grow up having a different experience, and you know, sitting down at their desk and you know, legs crossed, hands down, you know. Schools are going to have to change. Mm -hmm. And in a large way, they already kind of have. I mean, just like with Internet laws versus, um, I mean, excuse me, the Internet versus the laws that we have for the Internet. They're behind. Well, it's because government moves at a snail's pace, if it moves at all. And the Internet's just kind of like... Mm -hmm. So... Which, ironically, is actually one of the better things about our system of government. But that is an entirely different discussion. Oh, I was going to say, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, so... Yeah, I'm I'm poli-sci education major, so... Mm -hmm. You know, oh, there's nothing I love more than, you know, discussing yeah. politics and then crying. 
Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anywho, on that note, uh, thank you everyone for joining us for episode number 41 of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast. And thank you, Andy, for hopping on with us. Oh, hey, yeah, anytime. Yeah, it was a pleasure. And I think uh, this is definitely a very large topic, like you said, Doc, that uh, probably uh, actually bears revisiting sometime in the near future. So yeah. we'll definitely have to do that sometime. So. Andy, what's your what's your website? And uh, oh. if, if anybody in the Dallas area wants to hire you since you are for hire. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, time for a shameless plug. Um, <laughs> for, you, hire specifically for educational. Related. Oh, well, yeah. For, well, <laughs> I, I also claim to be a hero for hire. Okay, there we go. Okay. Yeah, virgins rescue, dragon slain, that kind of thing. I've seen the cape. Yeah. Um, I think you're making a Luke Cage reference there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the beaver on your chest, is that your emblem? Or that's, right. <laughs> that's right. He's got the Bucky shirt on right now. That's so. right, yes. Yeah. So if, if you're not from Texas, you might not know what the hell we're talking that's about. That's right. And I do have a ring that has the, the language of, uh, it's Elvish, but it's mm-hmm. the language of Mordor, which I will not utter here. <laughs> um, but no, you can find me on Facebook, uh, Andrew Howell, uh, or you can go to uh, www.howellsacademy.com. Uh, and uh, there you can find that I, I basically I service I, I service the Dallas area you know Plano um, uh, sometimes Allen Rowlett Garland um, I can meet you at your place of residence or at a library uh, I do one on one sometimes I will teach classes for homeschools uh, give me a ring look me up uh, I've got resources I've got a blog that I've started up uh, let me help you with your educational needs cool I'm Chris I'm Jim I'm Doc. I'm Andy, and we'll see you guys next time. We want you to join the discussion on our website, backward-compatible.com. You bring unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment in our podcast section, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, tell us about your experience with games and learning, and what you wish was different. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward compatible.